A big day down in Brunswick, Georgia, in the other big trial we're covering. Ahmaud Arbery shot and killed three men accused of his murder. The man who pulled the trigger, Travis McMichael, taking the stand in his own defense. Um, but he's one of three defendants. And there are three defendants with three legal defense teams, each with an opportunity to bring their own case, right? Now, we know, we understand the defense doesn't have to prove a thing. They never do. The burden is on the prosecution to prove the case beyond any and all reasonable doubt. However, many times here on Court TV, we see the defense bring evidence in and, and try to raise a reasonable doubt, bring up some issues that the uh, prosecution has not talked about, bring forth some evidence, some testimony. And today, um, a little shocking what happened. Let me show you. Uh, we are ready to proceed with the case uh, from Travis McMichael. Your Honor, on behalf of Travis McMichael, we rest. Thank you, Your Honor. Greg McMichael. Your Honor, on behalf of Greg McMichael, we rest. On behalf of Mr. Bryan. Your Honor, on behalf of, of Mr. Bryan, uh, we've discussed this with the state. Uh, rather than being compelled to republish the Night Owl porch video, still picture of Mr. Bryan's residence, republished uh, Night Owl 2 video with the trucks. And rather than publishing this excerpt from the state exhibits of investigator Officer Minshew and it, Detective Lowry, the state has agreed that we don't need to republish those today since we went through that yesterday, uh, reserve the right to do that during closing statements. I assume that's been discussed with the state. It has, Your Honor. With that understanding, we rest. He can never do it in the most simple, straightforward way, can he, Kevin Goff? I mean, but he rested. So Kevin Goff and Roddy Bryan, no evidence. Greg McMichael and his legal team, no evidence. So the whole defense really relies upon the defense of Travis McMichael and really relies upon the testimony of Travis McMichael. Today, cross-examination. Let's take a look. So when you first pulled up to him, very first time, you confirmed it was him, right? Yes, ma'am. All right. You've testified under oath to this jury that I'm not going to chase or investigate someone who is armed, right? That's correct. And yet you want this jury to believe now that he was a threat to you, okay, and that you perceived him as a threat, yet you continued to chase him down Burford. I didn't know if he was a threat or not. He never reached in his pockets, and I wanted to see what was happening. I figured I could talk to him at this point, or, you know, getting up to him on the second point. But hadn't at this point he demonstrated not once, not twice, but three times he did not want to talk to you? Uh, which, when, when I'm at the stop, when I stop the Burford? Right, because you pulled up to him once, he doesn't want to talk to you. You back up, he doesn't want to talk to you. You pull down Burford, your dad's yelling, cut him off, cut him off. And all of a sudden, he runs back, he doesn't want to talk to you. That's three times he's demonstrated to you that he does not want to talk to you, correct? Yes. And he's also demonstrated he's no threat to you. He hasn't pulled out a gun. That's correct. He hasn't said one word to you. He has not. He's not threatened you in any way, verbally or physically. No, ma'am. No knives. No knives. All right. So you're telling this jury that a man who has spent five minutes running away from you, you're now thinking is somehow going to want to continue to engage with you, someone with a shotgun, and your father, a man who's just said, stop or I'll blow your head off, by trying to get in their truck? That's what it shows, yes ma'am. So you didn't shoot him because he grabbed the barrel of your shotgun, you shot him because he came around that corner and you were right there, and you just pulled that trigger immediately. No, I was struck, and he was, we were face to face and being struck, and that's when I, when I shot. So he came up, I think it was when we were hit, he started striking, he was on me, he had a shirt or, you know, something to that point, and I had the gun. So you're saying that all of that took place. He's got your shirt. He's striking you. You've got the gun up in this 
thing and you can't draw down on him and it's just it's a struggle and he's on you and you're going back and forth in front of the truck is that what you're saying yes okay Is that what happened? That's on the video, yes ma'am. Okay. And he was shot right here in the torso, and it all came up, with all the pellets right back here. Okay? So your gun was parallel to the ground. Yes? Yeah, if you grab a shotgun and snatch it away, it will straighten a shotgun out. Yes, ma'am. All right, so which one was it? Was it like this or was it like this? It was obviously like that in the video. Yes, ma'am. Okay. During your statement to the police, did you say that you and your father were trying to arrest Mr. Arbery, did you? In the statement? Yeah, to the police. Uh, no, ma'am. All right. You never told the police that you said to Mr. Arbery, you're under arrest, correct? I did not. Okay. In fact, you never did tell Mr. Arbery, you're under arrest for the crime of fill in the blank. I didn't have time. I was still trying to get him to stop. Now let's talk a bit about your attitudes towards sort of vigilantism, okay? okay. Um, you've posted several times on Facebook some things, and we talked about one of them in response to Kim Ballesteros, where it's like, you're playing with fire on this side of the neighborhood. Do you remember posting that? Yes. As I was watching that cross-examination today, I thought early on it was kind of clunky and slow, but in the end it picked up, especially when they're talking about the moment of the shooting, which is the most significant part. I think it finished with an exclamation point, but let's bring in uh, Court TV legal correspondent Julia Janae, who is in Brunswick, Georgia tonight. Um, Julia, this was the continuation of the cross-examination. started yesterday. I thought it was kind of slow yesterday. I thought it started kind of slow this morning. But it seemed the intensity, um, everything picked up once they started talking about the actual shooting. It did pick up because there are questions that Travis McMichael has to answer that don't necessarily jive with what we see on the video. And I thought Linda Donikowski did a great job of showing him that video after he tries to explain what happened. This really all happens in the blink of an eye. And I see that Travis McMichael is doing something I didn't expect. Uh, he, we knew, was going to be raising citizen's arrest as the initial defense. That that's why they were chasing Ahmaud Arbery, and that's why he was going towards him with a gun to try and arrest him. And that when that encounter happened, then the allegation is that Ahmaud Arbery grabbed his gun and there's a struggle, and then it becomes a self-defense case. But in his testimony on the stand, he shifts. He actually says that this was a self-defense case starting from when Ahmaud Arbery is running towards them, what we see in that video. So essentially, he said he was afraid for his life and his father's life from the moment that Ahmaud Arbery is running towards their truck that is stopped at the front and William Roddy Bryan is in the back. I don't know how that will play with the jury or if they notice this change, essentially, in what we were all thinking was going to be this argument in front of the jury. And, and that is... Uh, and that kind of works in sync with what I was getting from um, Travis McMichael, almost blaming Roddy Bryant to a certain extent for what Roddy Bryant was doing that day. It was, it was very unexpected to me. Oh, they completely uh, distanced themselves from William Roddy Bryan through this testimony. He acted like he wasn't even sure who Bryan was, what his truck was doing. They are clearly trying to say they were not acting in concert. Bryan's truck just happened to be there. At one point in his testimony, he said he didn't know if Arbery and the truck were together and that they were both coming after him and his dad. But then ultimately what he saw that was going on with the truck, he said, raised his amount of reasonable fear. And he said there was the probability, it's a word that he used that he didn't use on the scene, that this was a suspect who was going to do something dangerous to him. And it's that front of the truck that's the issue. We can't see what's going on. That's when the first shot happens. It happens so quick. He says Ahmaud Arbery came for him and he was just trying to keep an eye on him. 
Is it clear to this jury when the gun is raised? When the gun first comes up and is pointed at Ahmad Arbery? The prosecution has done a good job of that. They have an exhibit that actually shows the first time that this shotgun is raised at him in that uh, clip that we've all seen in the viral video. And it's when there's still at least 10 feet between Travis McMichael and Ahmaud Arbery. It's when he's running towards the truck before he cuts to the right to go around it. The shotgun is already raised. And Travis McMichael says he's doing that because he thinks that Arbery is coming towards him, that he is going to attack him in some way, and that's why he raised his gun. Then he says he brings it down. He kept saying he had it port of arms so that he's not pointing it, and that he went around the front of the truck and that Arbery came around the front of the truck, but he doesn't say that he went after Arbery in that moment. It's so brief. When you watch the video, it's almost a blink of the eye to know which person went towards the other. Travis McMichael admits he go, went to the front of his truck, but he says he didn't go around to where Arbery was. Did Arbery run into him when he went around the truck or did he go after them? That's the question this jury is going to have to decide. And what's the explanation for why the truck is stopped and why he is outside of the truck? Because you, you watch the video and I think what everyone would take away from it is there's one truck behind him He's running away from that truck, and then there's another one that's blocking the road in front. Um, I heard him say there was no coordination, so what's the explanation, what's the reason that the truck is stopped and he is outside of the truck? He claims it's because he stopped chasing Arbery. He was concerned about what was happening. He had seen the attack with the black truck, or what they characterized as an attack, um, and they were trying to see who would call police. He says he thought his dad had called police from the beginning of the chase, and in this moment, he didn't realize that the police had not been called, so he's getting his cell phone, calling police. He's getting his gun out of the truck, which had fallen down onto the floor, and when he sees Ahmaud Arbery, to use his words, coming at him, he then hands the cell phone to his father to make that 911 call. And then that's when he raises his shotgun towards Arbery. All right, let's bring in the think tank, get some reaction to all of this and to really the only really significant witness for the defense, which is Travis McMichael. Joining us tonight in the Bronx, New York, criminal defense attorney Renee Hill. In Houston, Texas, criminal defense attorney Carmen Rowe. And in Atlanta, Georgia, criminal defense attorney, law professor at Emory University, Molly Palmer with us. Great to see everyone tonight. Uh, Renee, are they, are, is he raising a reasonable doubt or just raising his gun here? What, what's going on? <laughs> I think he's raising his gun, Vinny. I don't believe that he has presented uh, enough in the defense case to show reasonable doubt here. I just don't see it. His story didn't make sense. And when the prosecutor put that story up against the video and asked him questions about that and his answers did not equate to what the jurors are seeing, he's asking them to not believe what they're seeing on the video. And it was not plausible at all. Carmen Rowe, um, that's a great point. You know, you, you look at the Rittenhouse case and, and, you know, you have video there. We've got video here and, and the stories have to match what we see with our eyes. Well, it's a little different, a little different, because the most important points in this case can't be seen on the video. So we're left to believe, you know, uh, Travis McMichael or to believe the version that the state's presenting about what actually occurred in front of the truck. And while I don't think that Travis did a great job today on the stand, I think it was really important for him to testify about this alleged incident that happened on February 11th, earlier in the year, where he had some identification of Arbery, allegedly, and that perhaps he was a threat at that time to reinforce his now uh, self-defense claim that he was actually feeling threatened that day. Molly Palmer, you practice in Georgia. You know this stuff inside and out, uh, and you know these juries inside and out. I mean, in, in a case like this where he gets up and tells his story, um, to what level does the jury have to uh, agree with him? Like, like, I know the defense doesn't have to prove anything. They don't have to prove anything beyond a reasonable doubt. Like, how much, what, what, if you put a number on it, 
would they have to think it's like, well, there's like a 25% chance that, that, that what he's telling us is true or, uh, you know, lines up to what happened that day? Is it 50%? Is it 10%? What is it? Well, I mean, I'm not going to like, I don't think I can quantify it for you, Vinny, but there's an instruction that they're going to give the jury and that they give in any case in Georgia that says credibility is for you to decide. And so these jurors are able to basically listen to his testimony today and decide whether or not they want to give it any credence whatsoever. And certainly they are empowered and they are instructed by the judge that if they don't find him credible, if they think his testimony is inconsistent with the medical examiner, with the part of the video that we can see, they can basically say, you know what, let's throw it out entirely. They don't have to take anything that he said into consideration because if they don't find him credible, it's done. So, Renee, the other defendants, no one else testified. So the, everyone seems to be banking on Travis McMichael. Roddy Bryan didn't do anything to separate himself from these two. He's relying upon Travis McMichael separating himself from Roddy Bryan. Um, what are your thoughts about why we didn't hear from the other defendants and why we didn't hear any evidence from the other defendants? Well, you know, the jury is going to be told that they are ha they are going to be deliberating on the entire case, of course, but they have to deliver a separate and distinct verdict for each defendant in this case. And Roddy Bryan's attorney, Mr. Goff, believes that he did enough that his cross-examination of the state's witnesses was sufficient to not have to put on a case. So he's not necessarily relying on Travis's testimony, but he's relying on the fact that he believes he did enough in his cross-examination and that it was not necessary to put his client on the stand, that he didn't think that he would be able to add anything to it, and therefore he didn't put him on the stand. And the same thing for Greg McMichael. They believe that they have done enough in their cross-examination. All right.